Good evening, and welcome to St. John's Cathedral. I'm Dr. Christopher Gravis, and I have the honor of serving as Director of Choral Activities at Cal State LA, as well as serving as Canon for Music and Cathedral Arts here at St. John's. Tonight's concert marks the culmination of an annual week-long choral festival in which our many conducting graduate students, guests, and community members work with a renowned luminary in the choral field. This year is a little different for many reasons. Notably, we weren't able to hold a festival last year while in remote instruction. And this year, we're thankfully fully vaccinated, but you'll notice that we're singing with masks on. As you might have heard, it's been a tough year for choral musicians. But we're doing everything we can to rehearse and perform safely. And in following all local and county health gu guidelines, uh, I know it's a bit warm and uncomfortable out there. I thank you in advance for keeping your masks on while inside St. John's Cathedral. I want to especially thank all of you for supporting our program tonight, but also for being good citizens who are fully vaccinated yourself. I'm gonna say something that in some circles might be considered political these days, but it's not a political issue. It's an issue of scientific reality. If you care about choral music, or about a future in which you can attend live concerts, or go to a theater, or even visit family and friends over dinner, then we all need to do everything in our lives to urge the hesitant people to get fully vaccinated against COVID-19. This virus is now largely preventable, and our art form, our education systems, as well as the larger economy depend on public health. Okay, enough about that. I hope that following tonight's concert, you'll step onto the cloistered patio out here to your left, where you'll be welcome to take off your masks since we'll be outside and join us for a reception in honor of our conductor for tonight's program, Professor Donald Brenniger. Professor Brenniger is a conductor, tenor soloist, voice instructor, educator, and master class clinician. Professor Emeritus of Music at Pasadena City College, Don directed the Choral Studies program at Pasadena City College for 36 years. He also conducts the Donald Brenniger Singers, serves as the director of choruses for the Pasadena Symphony and Pops, and is an adjunct professor of voice at PCC. During the summers, he is an adjunct professor of conducting and voice in our graduate program in choral conducting, and we are so lucky to have him. We have all learned so much this week, studying under Don's brilliant and masterful interpretations of the music of his lifelong friend, Morton Lauritsen, and he'll be sharing with you his connections to Skip and his music. Please welcome my dear friend and colleague, Donald Brenniger.
I so agree. But this is the time you can applaud their efforts. So my dear friend, Morton Lauritsen, who I have known now for over 50 years, it's hard to say that word out loud, but it's true. I was a junior transfer student, um, undergrad to USC when I met Dr. Lauritsen, who was working on his master's degree at the same time. In his class were people like Ralph Pearson, Sonny Wilkerson, Michael Tilson Thomas. There was an old, a august group, and quite frankly, they scared the hell out of me. Their musicianship was so tall, their um, scholarship so deep, and especially in the program at SC at that time, there was a deep interest in early music, Palestrina, Monteverde, and the change of practice between those times was well studied, and Dr. Lauritsen was a great student of those particular pieces. In fact, one day walking down the hallway, he greeted me and said, I understand that you have a church choir. And I did. I was 20 years old, had the Presbyterian Church Choir in Monrovia, and uh, had just started, and he handed me a packet, and in the packet were two psalm settings. And I took them home, eager to, to learn them and look at them, and they were just far too hard for my, my <laughs> uh, church choir. So I said, thank you very much. I'll look forward to a day where I can perform your music with um, a choral ensemble that will give it its due. And uh, we maintained that friendship um, by exchanging music and exchanging ideas all through these past years. But what I particularly appreciated about uh, Dr. Lauritsen was his incredible attention to detail and to the subject matter of the text. So you'll find that the majority of the pieces that we are singing today deal with the whole aspect or aspects of love, and in particular, unrequited love. So rather than starting with Palestrina, we started with Monteverde and, and something that is filled with, as all these next pieces are, um, a bit of double entendre or a bit of, of um, uh, interplay between the partners in the, in the singing so that they are uh, illuminating the text. It's not a mistake that Dr. Lauritsen's middle name is Johannes, as his mother, a fine cellist, was a very large fan of Johannes Brahms. And this is music that Skip grew up with and knew very well. We've chosen the last of the set, uh, of number four of the Opus 92. Most of you might be familiar with the first piece in that opus, which is O Schöne Nacht, which is often performed. That's uh, followed by Spätherbst, then Abendlied, and then finally this concluding fairly short but brilliantly written and uh, featuring an accompaniment that I think influences the kind of accompaniments that Dr. Lawrence later writes. This is called Varum, why? A cry out to where are you God in this time of need.
so very grateful that the ambulance was in tune. <laughs> um, our next two pieces are, are real gems. I was very fortunate to be able to sing when I got to SC and the SC Chamber Singers under the leadership of Charles Hurt. He was a real champion of Halsey Stevens, whose office was right next to where we rehearsed, so we'd often see him poke his head in and, and get to about learning what we were doing, and especially when we had a chance to premiere one of his pieces. Um, a person who is an expert, Halsey Stevens, in the music of Bella Bartok, a world-class expert, again, um, a master of detail, uh, older practices of writing, yet with a fresh, modern approach to how sound should work. So it's no mistake that the influence of Halsey Stevens is in great choices in text, particularly texts that come from an earlier time. And uh, so Lordson has said a lot of music of the Renaissance uh, text uh, artists. He's um, uh, also picked 20th century, and as he says in his joke, he's very choosy about who he says, Neruda, Roca, Graves, God. Um, that was the joke, but I guess I didn't know where uh, Anyway, <laughs> you, pick, you pick great texts, and you have a chance to create great music. These next two, I think, are beautiful gems, which you'd be sung so much more often. First is Go, Lovely Rose, with the uh, poetry of Edmund Waller. And the second one, Like as a Culver, not as well known, with the poetry of Spencer. Two uh, secular motets by Halsey Stevens.
craft of taking a text and making it uh, illuminated from the music that you write. A particular genius of Dr. Lawrenson, but also as you can see in his mentor, Dr. Stevens, he had that same kind of craft, canon at one beat rather than waiting for several beats to travel by. Lots of imitation, um, movement of lines away from each other in contrary motion. Um, surprising harmonies at certain times and lots of mixed meter. Our next piece exemplifies all of those techniques and then some with a tour de force piano part um, uh, written for only a few accompanists who could play it because it's that challenging. And every time I pass it out to the choir, they look at the music and they say, when are we performing this? And we started this on Monday and here we are Saturday, and it is a satisfying piece to sing because his setting of the poetry is so uh, meaningful and so straightforward from the voice of Robert Graves. Uh, Robert Graves, who is really speaking about winter in the sense of separation, losing someone that they love dearly. Um, Robert Graves was a great character in literature and um, wrote uh, amazing and beautiful and deeply double entendre music, and here we have the same thing in the Midwinter Waking, where um, Lawrence has gathered five of the poems. There used to be a sixth movement to this piece. It was taken out, it's now a separate octavo, and rewritten in the early 90s for the Pasadena Chamber Orchestra under the direction of Robert Dewar, where they uh, did an orchestration of this piece. For the orchestration, an added interlude was given, for the piano and extended at the end, which is kind of a summarizing of all the themes of the whole piece. And then finally uh, rewritten for piano. And I was honored in uh, early 2000s at the 25th year publication of this work to be honored with the last movement being dedicated uh, to me for championing uh, Dr. Lawrence's music all these years. A brilliant piece. Take a time to read the poetry if you can read the small print. And this is Midwinter Songs.
in uh, 1997, um, Dr. Lauritsen uh, had the premiere in the spring of his beautiful Luke's Eterna uh, as he was part of the Los Angeles Master Chorale composer in residence. A rather famous composer was sitting in front of me <laughs> during the premiere. I was very fortunate to have the full score in front of me and was enjoying watching the music pass by as the brilliant Paul Solomonovich conducted the premiere. And at the conclusion of the concert, this particular composer, who's kind of famous for angular and rather, um, I would say, contrapuntally nice, but not always um, melodically friendly music, uh, turned to me and said, all I heard was lush after lush after lush. And I said, yes, and it's going to become very famous, lush after lush after lush, as it has. That spring, we invited Dr. Lauritsen to come up to a program we had at the University of Nevada, Reno, a similar master's program to this, and he was our festival featured guest, and we were going to do the piano version of Luke's Eterna. That fall, my uh, singers were going to do the organ version with Jim Guanamani um, here in L.A., who orchestrated the organ part for Luke's Eterna. And we went through the Luke's Eterna, and we um, talk, he talked about his writing and where he got his ideas. And someone asked at the end of the session, well, you keep referring to Cole Porter and Vincent Newmans and Richard Rogers as these great melodists, and that you're very moved by them, but have you ever written any popular music? And he paused for a long time, and he looked up and says, yeah, well, I did, but I don't want anybody to hear it. Of course, you can't tell a group of graduate students you've written something and you can't hear it. you got to hear it. And so he sat at the piano and played this next piece, which totally moved all of us, and we turned to him and said, you have to publish that. It's just too good. And uh, which he did as a solo version and on his album, Northwest Journey, the uh, incredible Ralph Pearson and Sonny Wilkerson realized the piece. What happens to a lot of uh, solo music and choral music of composers today, uh, the market goes to bear and says, we need a version for SSA, SATV, SAB, solo with guitar, solo with piano, solo with harp. We need all of these things. We need to have enough to, to give to our community. And so a few years ago, uh, Dr. Lauritsen had this set. What's really interesting about this piece, of all the settings that Dr. Lauritsen has created, this is his very own poetry. Where have the actors gone?
brings back the feeling of old standards, doesn't it? Of, uh, someone that can write a beautiful melody and set the text so beautifully. In our next uh, piece, originally composed for chorus, we're going to show how he went the opposite direction and composed it for a soloist. The story's kind of intriguing. Um, the wonderful Bruce Brown and his Coral Cross Ties had recorded the Midwinter and the Madrigali and were preparing a concert where they wanted to do something new and they had talked to Dr. Lordson, could you, could you compose a piece for us? Now this was done casually as they were eating dessert in a Portland bistro. And Dr. Lawrence said, yeah, well, we'll talk about it, uh, call me. So about a year later, Skip gets a call from his mom, congratulations on the new premiere. And Skip says, what premiere? He says, Coral Cross Ties is premiering a new piece by you. He says, I have no piece for them. <laughs> and so he calls Bruce and says, what's up? He says, well, you said you compose a piece. And I said, yeah, call me. I think you forgot the phone call. And <laughs> so happened that he was working on uh, music of, uh, or texts of Rilke. Rilke, who at the end of his life, a German poet, wrote a little over 400 poems in French of which several uh, were on the subject of roses. And he had on his piano uh, a sketch he had made of uh, one of these pieces called Divetant. He sits down within two weeks, writes the piece, sends it up to uh, Oregon, and says, good luck with your premiere, I hope it goes well. This is an encore piece for you. It's a little chanson populaire, I hope you enjoy it. But he got so inspired by writing the piece that in the next two months, he wrote four more settings, and now it became the Rose Songs. And so we would like to feature one of our faculty, Dr. John St. Marie, who teaches conducting and voice for us at the university, as he gives you the solo rendition of Dia de Tom.
Actually, Simon, thank you. So we close our program. We don't particularly want to, but that's all we can learn in a week. Sorry. <laughs> it was an ambitious program to learn in one week, but I'm so grateful to the graduate students and their hard work, and uh, also to the person who uh, leads our program, who's had to deliver such uh, continually set bad news as we try to organize a program, but always found a way to make it work. And, and now we are able to be in this beautiful facility and sing this lovely concert for you. I'd like to thank the graduates and also their leader, Dr. Gravis. <laughs> Pretty much every year for many years, uh, Skip would call me in the spring and say, what are you up to, any activities? Proud to say that we were the first program at Pasadena City College to feature a retrospective of all of Lauritsen's choral cycles and his two solo cycles at the time, back in 1994. And we've done so now another seven or eight times in various locations uh, around Southern California, and including uh, Honor Choir, where we featured his music up in San Francisco. I was coming back from the Missouri All-State, Collegiate All-State, where I was conducting, and we had premiered a piece by, Jay, uh, by Randall Stroop um, called Sure on the Shiny Night. And of course, we all know the barber. It's very famous, famous solo, as well as also a famous choral setting. <clears throat> And I said, Skip, do you know Sure on the Shiny Night? He said, the barber? And I said, yes. He said, why don't you set that? I just hear your voice in it. I can hear your voice. He says, are you kidding me? That's so famous. How could I ever outdo that? And I said, well, you did set O Monium Mysterium, and it's done pretty well. And he said, well, you got me there. So it took him four to five years, I think, of pondering that and sketching and thinking about it. And then called me and said, we've been asked, I've been asked by ACDA, to write a commissioned piece, and I'd like to choose the texture on the shiny night, and would your singers premiere for us at the at the convention here in LA? And I said, sure. Well, as Skip is one to do, once he got inspired, it morphed into a five movement work, and we decided to do the three middle movements, and now he's since added back a fourth. So it's now a four um, movement cycle, of which this is the third that we're gonna sing for you, this wonderful James A.G. poem, which kind of sums up the spirit, I think, of Skip and the love of nature, the love of, of earth, the, the love of people, and the aspiration to always, you know, rise to the stars. Sure, on the shining moon.
are amazing and such a gift to us. I don't know how you play that. If someone ever gave that to me and told me I had the entire, my rest of my lifetime and a lifetime after that to play that Lord's and Midwinter songs, it could never happen. You are just amazing and not just your piano playing, but honestly a vocal coach and uh, the, the, you're just so connected to us when you're there and I just so appreciate you. So thank you so much for all that you do for us. We really appreciate you. Today, I thought it would be a good idea to make a flower arrangement because I have such skill in that area, and that's a lie. Um, but I went to the florist and they told me that what I wanted to create couldn't be made. And when I hear the word I can't, this man has taught me to say, to not say that. So I took all of the flowers that they refused to put together into an arrangement, and I did my very best to Fibonacci them for you. <laughs> So there is, <laughs> I tried to spiral them, I'm sorry Don. They were right, I couldn't, couldn't be done. But you'll get it when you count them all up, they are all there. And the reason why is because that is just one of the many things that we learn in this pedagogy um, on how to design our rehearsals, how to design so many things in life. Um, so what I'd like to first do is thank Dr. Bravis for providing us with the opportunity to see an entire week of all of the pedagogy that we learn in practice, everything from the conducting pedagogy, vocal pedagogy, um, just everything. <laughs> Thank you for that opportunity because we see how much it works. Look at the amount of music that we were able to get done in a week and do our homework at the same time. I don't know how it happened. Don, you are such a gift to this choral community. Um, you are a master voice technician. You are a gifted conductor. You are an amazing music educator. You have a heart for music teachers, and you teach us to be better people all the time. One of the things that you have always taught me is, in all this preparation that we have to do, to be an adult, and learn everything as an adult, and study, and do all of the intense work, but keep that child still there. And that's what I see when you're conducting. I know all the work, well, I don't know all the work that you put into it, I can't even imagine. But you have so much fun, and you have taught us to play, and that is so key. So thank you for everything that you do for us. From the bottom of our hearts, thank you for who you are. I need wine. <laughs>